Yes, All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, our speaker, Patricia Oaks, needs no introduction to this group, but I'll give one anyways. So um, Patricia is from Minnesota originally, and it reminds me of the joke about the meanest thing a Minnesotan ever said. Just the service was so bad, I almost said something. And I think that that uh, fits her, her personality. So she um, did her undergraduate degree in great books at University of Notre Dame, so the cool uh, major. Uh, then she attended law school at Georgetown. She worked as a lawyer for several years, but that wasn't a great fit for her, so she returned to school as a medical student at University of Michigan. And since she graduated, she's been here at University of Washington. She came in 2002 for her internship, neurology residency, and since 2009 has been um, the residency program director. And not uh, just our residents benefit from our interest in resident training, but we all benefit from the effort you put into providing excellent training to these folks. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you guys as well. And she's going to talk about how to train the neurologist to us today. So without further ado, thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right. Um, OK, so here we go. Uh, so this is what we'll talk about very in, in broad strokes, um, the many steps in training a neurologist, so medical school, selection process. We'll spend the bulk of our time on residency training itself, various aspects of that, and then just a little time on, on fellowship. Um, just a couple things before we, I really get started that I want people to contemplate as we're talking about this, and, and this is completely US-centric, okay, so I'm not talking about neurology anywhere else but in our own country. Um, so what does neurology look like, sort of big picture? So the ABPN, or the board, was founded in 1934. In 1948, the AAN was founded with 52 charter members. And I like, this is from their own um, current website. It elevated the status of neurology as a practice distinct from psychiatry. So we won't tell the psychiatrist that. Um, uh, as of 1947, so right around that time, there were 300 people who described themselves as neurologists. 32 residents throughout the country. Um, by 1970, the numbers of neurologists had increased and the number of residents had as well. And this is a total number of residents. So for it's always been a, um, a three-year residency for neurology, one-year medicine, um, sometimes more years medicine. And then by 2012, about 22,000 neurologists and over 1,800 residents, so growing throughout the years. It wasn't until 1981 uh, that the ACGME was founded, the national organization that sort of oversees all accredited residencies. And then a couple other important institutional things for residencies. 2003 was the year that the duty hour, the, sort of the most substantial duty hour reforms went into place, um, particularly the 80 hour work week. Uh, and then in 2011, there was some tweaking to those duty hour rules. And then if we add on the sort of clinical, when were, when did various, um, uh, especially diagnostic tests, when were they first available? So EEGs, uh, the first EEG, at least the first publication about the first EEG was 1929. Um, and then I think it was, I think the first EEG lab was in the mid-30s, so that was in use for quite some time. It wasn't until the mid-1970s that uh, we saw CTs, um, head CTs, and I suppose other parts of the body CT'd as well. Um, but really, when I'm talking to Dr. Bird, it wasn't until about 1980 that many institutions used them with any regularity. Uh, the mid-1980s was MRI, and I actually don't know if that also it was a little bit of a lag so that people weren't using it too much until the 90s. And then I certainly didn't put down all types of therapies, but just to keep in mind that a lot of the therapies that we use today for various diseases were not around even, you know, 20, certainly 30 years ago. So I just put down, there's our first MS drug, was 1993. Um, and I looked, even to when I was training, I had a little cheat sheet of the four MS drugs that were available, and that's all I ever talked to patients about. 96 was when TPA was approved. Okay. Um, all right, so. Every, um, in medicine, we always like to focus on specific cases and not just talk in vague generalities. So um, one of the, or, or an important person I'm going to talk about today is, does anybody know who this is? We know him. He looks he's, like Nick Freeberg, kind of. He sort of does, yeah. He's sitting in this room. <laughs> if he was talking, he would have a very impressive uh, sonorous. I think Dr. that's Bird. the right word. It's Dr. Bird. Okay. So this is Dr. Bird at around the time that he started residency. And um, so I'll be, he'll be sort of one of my 
um, uh, highlights. And then we want to talk about someone from the present, too. So um, I suspect a lot of people recognize this person who is also sitting here in the room. So this is Dr. Ramba, one of our um, graduating residents this year. So um, I'll just be doing a little bit of comparisons and focusing um, uh, on them, not too personally. All right. So thinking from the beginning, uh, in training a neurologist, we have to start with medical school, right? If uh, at least in this day and age, if you don't decide in medical school to be a neurologist, that opportunity is lost. Um, so in medical school, what affects someone's decision to go into neurology? Um, should we encourage people to go into neurology? Should we care? I mean, we, 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 everybody likes people to go into their specialty, but sort of objectively, is there a reason we should be encouraging people to do neurology? And just to put a backdrop on this, um, I think we have an answer to that question now. Should we encourage people? But when I was looking through the literature in the 80s and well into the 90s, there seemed to be a lot of consternation and hand-wringing about, um, do we have too many neurologists? And this was not just neurologists. This was other specialists. Because there was a big push then um, with the advent of HMOs and people really using HMOs to, uh, we need a lot more primary care providers. We need a lot fewer specialists. And so, um, and certainly the, you know, sort of uh, the, the um, managerial types in neurology and people who were writing about this were very worried that we had too many neurologists. Added to that was a worry that, and this seemed to really come to a head in about the mid-1990s, was that the pool of people interested in neurology had shrunk and that um, we were not only, maybe we were training too many, but we were not, um, people who weren't interested in going into neurology um, that, that were uh, really well qualified. And I think some of those concerns have really gone away. And one thing, so focusing first, and I think a lot of you uh, folks have seen this picture before, this is a study um, that came out in, I think, 2013, and it was focusing up to 2012. This is put up by the AAN, looking at what is the supply and demand of neurologists as of 2012. Um, and one thing to know, and that I, we're probably all aware of, is that there's a, really a disparity around the country in terms of, um, in the big city centers, especially the Eastern Corridor, there's maybe 10 times more neurologists per capita, that, per capita um, than there are in some of the uh, rural areas and some of the, the bigger states, I would say. Um, but as of 2012, the dark pink is the places where there's a demand of 20% or more oversupply. So you see a lot of dark pink. Um, and then the light pink, us, sort of the demand of 6 to 19 percent um, below the supply. And then projecting, and types of things that are used in projecting, of course, are the supply of neurologists, and people are, think that that's not going to go up too much. It will, it will remain probably relatively the same as today, but especially the um, aging of the population. And so that's, that's part of how we're going to need more neurologists. So this is a projection into 2025, and you see even more dark pink. Um, and still, it's just kind of these uh, eastern states where um, that are thought to gonna, uh, have enough neurologists. Now, if you were to look at these numbers for pediatric neurology, it would be even more dismal because um, right now there's already a, a, a much bigger mismatch between supply and demand for pediatric neurologists. All right, so neuroscience and neurology in medical school. So first, let's, I mean, what we think about most is the clinical time, and that's what we um, I think people have focused the most on, perhaps rightly. So a neurology clerkship, this surprised me. It, it is required at only 56% of medical schools. Uh, many of the ones that don't require it still have it as an elective, or they report that they have it as an elective. Uh, and then uh, the split in between when you do your clerkship is about 50-50 at those schools, split between the third and the fourth year. The AAN recommends that the clerkship be placed in the third year, not surprisingly, because that's when you can get people interested in neurology in time to make a decision about residency. Um, obviously, you could do it early in your fourth year, and that might be good, too. Here at the University of Washington, it is a fourth-year elective. Uh, I know that uh, many people would like to change that, and it's also really difficult to make that type of a change. Um, I also, it sounds like, at least from talking to the people who are helping to redesign the curriculum, it might be more possible to push it a little bit earlier now that we have more clinical time. That's, that's one of the big changes in the new um, undergraduate, or excuse me, medical school curriculum is to, to have more clinic time even in your second year. So hopefully, maybe more people could do neurology then. The AN also recommends, I think wisely, that uh, people should have both inpatient and outpatient experiences as a student so that they see kind of the, the full breadth of neurology. 
Um, and then I, I can't tell you all that much about, you know, we, we have a, a neuroscience course. How much does that influence people's decisions? Certainly when I interview people, many people will sort of harken back to that was one of the first things where they really got excited about neurology. Although now people, even before they go to medical school, people are majoring in neuroscience. So that's also a, a bit of a new development. And so people, some people go into medical school really knowing they want to do neurology. There's this concept of neurophobia that's been written about uh, a, a bit. There were some studies, one was in Ireland and the other one was, don't remember where, um, about uh, people sort of having a phobia of things neurologic. That's really hard. I don't want to go into it. It's too difficult. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And then because um, people have been worrying about these things for a while, uh, the AAN has had a number of resolutions and this is just the flavor of them. So in 2000, um, they, they, they came forward and said, we really need to attract youth to our field. They are the future, of course. And so the types of things they come up with proposing, we need a website, we need to encourage sign groups. And I think they've been successful at that. There's a lot more sign groups now. And then basically, we need to educate students. The, the word awesome is mine. But um, the overall, um, all the things, all the new therapies, et cetera, that neurology isn't just a, a, a sort of a diagnose and audio specialty. So then getting this, this concept of neurophobia, um, this was a study uh, that was done um, interviewing both uh, medical students and residents. Uh, and I think it was just at one institution. It was basically putting in front of them all the different specialties in medicine and then asking them questions about knowledge base. You know, what, how do you think your knowledge base is in this specialty? How difficult does it seem to you? And what is your confidence in managing, in sort of diagnosing and managing these patients. And neurology was sort of the one where people, the people were rating the lowest in, in, on all those um, uh, categories. I think nephrology came close in terms of difficulty. But otherwise, uh, people felt the least confident about neurology. Now, one thing that was good was that as they advanced in training, so and, and the residents would have been internal medicine residents, an internal medicine resident felt better about neurology, at least about their, their abilities, to, especially to diagnose problems. And that might be because of exposure, because another thing they asked about in this study was, how many neurology patients have you seen this year? And this would be clinical medical students. And a, a, a large chunk of them, I think 30%, had seen fewer than 10 patients. And then the vast majority had seen fewer than 30 patients, so not, not that many. And you can imagine if at only 56% of schools is there a required clerkship that that might come into play. Also, it's up to the students to define what's a neurologic problem, and maybe they wouldn't categorize all cases of headache or back pain in that, in that category. And then this, in the same article about neurophobia, they were asking people what might help, what might make you um, sort of uh, uh, score neurology higher or, 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 or make it more approachable. And far and away, the biggest answer was more patient exposure, more bedside teaching. What people didn't think would help was really more, more lectures um, so much. Uh, and, and, and keep in mind, this is not just for people going into neurology. So a lot of concern about neurology is also focused on the fact that primary care providers and lots of different people have to know, you know sort of basic neurology, both to treat people and to know when to refer. So other things that are going to encourage students to go into neurology are pretty obvious. Um, if there is a, a required clerkship, more people end up going into neurology. So here's the, just those numbers from showing uh, different medical schools where there is or is not a required clerkship. Um, and along the same lines, and this, this kind of looks at various areas of neuroscience, so neurology, um, neurosurgery, and child neurology. If there's a residency in-house, then again, students are going to be more likely to go into neurology. All right, so we're well set up on all those fronts here at the University of Washington. Uh, and then talking about medical school, let's harken back to Dr. Bird when he was in medical school. So what kinds of things encouraged Dr. Bird to go into neurology in medical school? And, and actually, he might have been a little bit different than some of his peers. Um, one of the things that he told me was actually in medical school, people in, at that point in time, people didn't want students to decide too early what they were going into. So the thought really was maybe you were going to decide surgical or medical, but then waited for your internship to really decide what you were going to specialize in afterwards. That said, um, Dr. Bird did spend a couple of summers working with uh, Dr. Fred Plum, uh, looking at, I think, EEG and coma, EEG and sleep. So I think he had a leaning even then, even if he had not completely uh, signed on the dotted line. 
Dr. Ramba, I reviewed your application and it was not as clear to me. I probably should have talked to you about what your motivations in medical school were, although I saw that you worked with a lot of, one thing that was really important or is really important now is working with patients, of course, before you go to medical school. And Dr. Ramba had worked um, uh, with a number of patients, especially in the rehab area, so probably was thinking that she'd like that patient population ahead of time. And I think that's a common pathway now. All right, so the selection process. How do we select residents today? How is it different back then? And I think we're all quite familiar with the selection process of today, right, is the match. Um, so we here at the University of Washington for Neurology this last year received over 600 applications. We interviewed more than 80 people for our seven slots. Um, applicants end up interviewing at usually now more than 10 places, oftentimes 15, verging on 20 places. Um, if it's a different specialty, way more than that, right? So that's kind of the process for today. And you all know the length of the application that a resident, or excuse me, that a student uh, submits, uh, uh, getting uh, three or four or five letters of recommendation, writing a, a one page plus personal statement, lots of forms to fill out and submit them all kind of online. And then back in the, back in the day, so this is Dr. Bird's application. And one thing to know is when he came here and did his internship, his internship included, it was supposed to include one month of neurology, one month of psychiatry. He did his neurology month um, with Dr. Phil Swanson, liked it so much, he asked if he could do a second, um, was probably quickly granted that. Um, and then he talked to Dr. Swanson, who noticed that he was interested, and they were already had sort of discussed him going into neurology. So um, it was probably decided in a sort of casual way, it sounds like. Nevertheless, he submitted an application. I highlighted just a couple things that were interesting. So it asks for your wife's name if you're married. Just It doesn't say spouse, but that's because there really were no women. Very few, I shouldn't say, but very few women in neurology. But it does ask things like your marital status, how many kids you have, what's your height and weight. Um, so just a, a sign of the times, I guess. Um, Dr. Plum wrote him a letter of recommendation. Um, he was asked to write a brief narrative note about why he wanted to go into neurology, and it was brief. It was an 11-line paragraph. It was typed. Um, uh, other people whose applications I reviewed actually just wrote something in cursive. Uh, and then Dr. Bird was asked to submit his application. You, I don't know that you can read it here, but in quintuplicate. Quintuplicate. That's how it was done, right? So was this when you did your medicine, right? And then this was his neurology. He would have done something similar. No, you had, you had a, a match for your medicine internship, and I'm not sure what that application looked like. So this would have been for the neurology residency. When was neurology separate from like, because you two have to do medicine and then neurology, right? Um, you know, I don't know. I think it's been a long t I don't know that you ever had to do a full medicine residency, but I actually could speak to that. But when Dr. Bird applied, you just needed to do an internship, even though many people did a residency or did two years. He didn't have to, so oh, okay. so uh, yeah. so the vast majority of places back in the 50s and 60s, neurology residencies just required an internship, mm -hmm. and that was all. Mm -hmm. There were very few that required an additional one year of a medicine residency. Cornell was one of the few mm -hmm. that did. But so uh, a total this, of two years. Yeah, this place did not, and, and most did not. Most were right after internship. Mm -hmm. But is it true that some people approach it like a fellowship? They would complete medicine and then complete a subspecialty? A few, but relatively few. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was, the, it was the exception. Also worth saying they didn't have copy machines back then when you had to do things with print top of it. No. Seriously? It was called carbon paper. Oh, right. Paper. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I didn't even think about that. And it's, it's, it was a typewriter, not a word processor. That's true. So no mistakes. Well, hopefully. Oh. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, couldn't tell. Okay. okay. Um, so let's see. I think that was that's all I needed. I wanted to say on the application. Um, oh, I guess the other thing is I asked Dr. Bird how, why did you decide on here on the University of Washington? And he had his, his a story and um, but basically how people decided when I asked Dr. Swanson, he said it was word of mouth. There wasn't a way that programs really advertised. Um, uh, so someone maybe they talked to their dean at medical at their medical school. I'm not sure, but there obviously wasn't a website to go look at. Uh, so it was just a lot more um, maybe uh, casual or serendipitous that someone would end up in a place. 
Um, I don't know when he started residency. Uh, he it would have been in the he came here and now I'm blanking on it whether it was 1964 or 67 those dates. He came here in the mid 60s and he did a PhD in London prior to that. So I, I think he may have been in the the end of the 50s that he like 59 or 60 that he finished up. And then when you applied Dr. Bird, did you apply to multiple programs back then or was it just one? So I so I applied for internship. Everybody applied for an internship when they were a senior in medical school. And I visited maybe five or six places and applied to five or six. I got my did my internship out here, and during my internship, uh, my 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 second and third months were on neurology here at the university hospital, or maybe my anyway it was in the first part of my internship. Maybe I think my first month was UW medicine, and then a year, a month of medicine at the VA, and then back here for when I did. I did a month of neurology and at Swanson and a guy named Mark Sumi, the Sumi service at Harvard he was one of my attendings. And I liked it so much. My next rotation was a month of psychiatry. And I asked Dr. Swanson if I could do a month of another month of neurology. He said, sure, and I asked psychiatry and they said that's okay. So I did two months of neurology. And then that second month of neurology, Swanson said, Well, would you like to be the neuro neurology resident here? And I said, I said, I'll go back and see what my wife thinks. <laughs> and I talked to her. So I didn't apply. This was after the fact. I didn't apply to any neurology residency. Zero. And the next day I said, yeah, I'd like to be a neurology resident here. We shook hands. That was it. <laughs> there was nothing like, I'm going to put you number one, or I'm going to rate no you very highly. And then another thing to know about Dr. Bird's residency is he was a resident here, a resident from 1969 to 1974. If you, if you do the math, that's a very long residency. Um, we actually did make people do residency for that long back then. But he wasn't I failed, here. I failed a couple of years. There you go. That's what it was. He was held back. Um, but he was not here for two years, and that was actually fairly common. So he got drafted. Um, I guess really the way it's, it works is that everybody got drafted, or every man got drafted. Um, not knowing exactly when in your career you would have to leave and go do your military work. And this was something called the Berry Plan, right? So um, he did his internship and then at some point during, in no, 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 it was during your residency, um, he was told that next year, so after his first year of neurology residency, he would be in the military for two years. And so I don't know how much of a notice um, either you or Dr. Swanson had in terms of um, trying to find someone else to, to fill that slot. But um, Dr. Bird was off to San Diego to do some boot camp and crawl in the dirt and um, learn how to take care of, uh, of, of other folks during boot camp. And, and, and that was very common, it sounds like. Right. It was the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. It was the middle of the Vietnam War, and so uh, they, they desperately needed physicians. So all, all male physicians who graduated from medical school were automatically in the military. And the vast percentage of the folks who Dr. Bird was training with in San Diego went to, to Vietnam, it sounds like. So, um, just uh, looking at uh, numbers for the match, um, and this, I, I just, I had to add in the, the years from longer ago down at the bottom. Um, so, um, and this, I'm sorry, this isn't numbers for match, this is total numbers of residents. So I've kind of alluded to this before, but you can see there's just kind of a growth over time. So in 1960, about 390, then up to 750 in, the, in 1970, over 1,000 in 1980, and then you can see along here how that grew over time. And then, just a couple things to pay attention to. As I was mentioning here, in the in the um, mid to late 1990s, um, at this point in time, there was only one U.S. Um, uh, senior, essentially, someone who trained at a U.S. medical school for each two slots that were available in, in neurology. So a lot of the slots ended up um, being filled by international medical grads. And this was a phenomenon sort of everywhere that started. I don't, you know, I, I think it started back in around this this sort of range, maybe even earlier in the 80s. Um, but definitely um, more so in neurology, so more slots were being filled by um, international medical graduates. And then over time, of course, there's, there's still a number of inter international medical grads, and that's, but that's gone down a bit as more U.S. graduates have become interested, I, I guess. Uh, and that's just made that same point. Um, so this last year, what kind of numbers do we have? So there was about 733 adult neurology positions. 725 were filled after all was said and done, after the... Um, soap the, or, or scramble, and about 70% were, were filled with U.S. graduates. 
and just a little um, tangent. So when, uh, when I don't know if anyone knows who this is. It's our first woman uh, neurology resident. Huh? Oh, I have her name right there. Yes, Dr. Ray. Oh, I didn't know she was at the VA. Okay. Uh-huh. She's the first woman um, who trained here, and she's. I thought she's. She's. She's at Highline. Was my okay, but I didn't know she was coming to the VA. She's Okay. All right. So this is Dr. Ray, and she was, and so she started in 1978, and then followed shortly thereafter. Two other women started the next year. Does anyone know who um, you would know this person? Her hair may have changed. It's Dr. Milliken. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is a, a Dr. A Mary. I don't know if it's Rife or Reef. Uh, um, Reef. Okay. Um, so then, the, so those were the first three women in pretty close order. Uh, the, just, I just want folks to know this, the stipend has changed a lot. So when Dr. Bird started in neurology, he was making 6500 a year. This did go up fairly quickly. By the end of the 70s, it had nearly doubled. Um, uh, and then uh, an N1 starting now this year would make 55000 How much was an apartment then, Dr. Bird? Yeah, how, was how much was an apartment? So I was, in my senior year in medical school, I was married, and this was in New York City, and we had a a one-room apartment, you know, stu a studio, right. but it was uh, subsidized by the medical school, and it cost us seventy-five dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it was a it was a third-floor walk-up studio. <laughs> and did you buy a house and came out here? No, oh, okay. not until uh, after my residency. Okay. And when I looked at it, the median this is was very was maybe very slightly below median income for the nation. I can't I can't figure it out for Seattle. And then this is right around the median income um, for now. So it's not that big of a change in real, real dollars. But I can't tell you. So the, uh, when I was an intern, if you go down to the very west end of the medical center uh, across the street, there's a big uh, parking garage yeah. down that way. Uh -huh. uh, that was uh, 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 residency housing. There was an apartment built in there, Wood wooden apartment. And that was our first apartment here, and we had we got a bedroom that time. And uh, but I don't remember I don't remember what it cost, but that was also subsidized by the UW, so it wasn't expensive at all. And was there a similar arrangement at Harborview with that um, building across the way? No, that was just for uh, overnight. Oh, okay. That was on, on call. Okay. So just like that with the consumer price, that's sixty five hundred and ninety seven forty thousand. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, and I think somehow one of my slides, well, maybe I'll come to it in a minute, but I had a slide showing um, sort of how, with, with the first women showing how um, uh, women uh, have really increased in numbers in neurology, and maybe I inadvertently deleted it, um, but uh, now if you look at the women who've most recently entered neurology, sort of people ages 30 to 35, it's almost 50-50, if not 50-50, so it really has changed over time. All right, so now talking a little bit more about the um, real, really the nuts and bolts of, of training in neurology. And I thought a place to start would be um, with Dr. Bird's rotation schedule from his N1 year. Um, and the thing that I envy about this is how delightfully simple it is. This would be so easy just to plug in um, all the names like that. But maybe the first thing people notice is how few residents there are. So if you count them up, there are seven, seven residents who covered um, all of these hospitals, and so there wouldn't have been a separate pediatric neurology resident. They would have been listed among these folks too. So these residents covered those hospitals, and then most of the time we're also covering another hospital, a public health hospital. I might have that name a little bit wrong. It's not listed here, maybe just because there were so few of you that that year. And this is an unusually low number. So I don't know if there were other people, you know, who were um, drafted away by the Barry Act or Barry Plan, or or why it was such a um, lean year that year, but there were seven residents covering those, those very hospitals. And, and then so in, in Dr. Bird's N1 year, um, he spent his first three months at the VA, um, sign of things to come maybe, and then uh, six months at Harborview, this was the old name for Harborview, uh, and then ended up at the, at the university. Um, during the, his, well, I'll show you a slide in a moment that gets into a little bit more of his other rotation. So other years he um, did some other things besides uh, inpatient work at the hospital. And then just thinking about. Can I make two other comments? Sure. Yep. 
the one is you'll notice a neuropathology was a six month rotation. We got, we got a lot of neuropathology, which for, as far as I'm concerned was extremely useful and very important and it was very much one on one uh, training in neuropathology. I, I liked it a lot. The other thing to notice is King County Hospital, which is Harborview, you'll notice it goes uh, Melnick, 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 Melnick. <laughs> oh. So that guy, our, my co, my co-resident, we started together. His name was Marty Melnick, and his first rotation was at Harborview, uh, and he came up to the university to give some grand rounds, and he was extremely depressed about it. He had a bad time. He thought he thought he got uh, pimped by the, the attendings too much, and he felt. Uh, uh, and, and so he said he would never go back to the university hospital. You could say that. And and he didn't. <laughs> he stayed the whole year at Harborview. <laughs> he did an entire rotation at Harborview, and then after that first year, he quit and did a urology residency. Oh, he was the urologist. <laughs> okay, and all became, right. And he became a urologist. Oh my God. Wow. So I have. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really haven't had questions, but I've had comments, which I haven't been repeating. And I will just uh, repeat here uh, Dr. Bird's remarks that people used to do six months of neuropath, which was extremely valuable, and then that there was uh, an, uh, an extreme amount of leeway given to residents um, back then. Um, and if you wanted to do a full year at Harborview, you were, you were absolutely permitted to do so. And how much calls were you taking all the time for? Because you're the only resident. At, at, at the VA, you were on call all the time. And Harvard, I was I was the only resident at the VA. And Harborview was like every other day. It was uh, every third because there was also on the rotation there was a medicine resident and at Harborview in addition to the medicine resident there was also a medicine intern. Oh. Okay. So there were actually four people covering the service. And the medicine folks would to help with would share the call. And at the VA, it was a neurology resident. I mean, I was a, an N one. I was the only neurologist in the hospital. <laughs> and one thing to note too. One, but there was a there was a psychiatry resident and a medicine resident, so there were three of us. Yeah. Okay. You were the only And I, at I, points, I told uh, Patricia that my first week at the VA, I got a consult on the medicine service, and I went to see the consult. It was a guy that I just finished my internship with, and he said, "I just did an internship with you." You, you can't give me a neurology consult. <laughs> that happens to our guys too, right? You, you, you were just an intern last week. That's it. Sorry. All right. This I, just by way of comparison, and this is our. This, oh, this is for actually for next year, this coming year. So the schedule's changed a little bit. Um, maybe one of the first things to notice is just there's a lot more residents. So the um, 23, including our um, pediatric neurology N1s. Um, People are still doing a fair amount of inpatient rotations, but what you start to see are some clinic rotations. So, for example, the dark purple, the dark green, and the dark orange are, are clinic rotations uh, scattered throughout. Well, the other thing is, so there was a hospital called the Public Health Hospital. You know the big orange hospital that you can see from the freeway that yeah. was Amazon yeah. and oh, Pac Med? Right. That was built as a public health hospital, and that was part of our rotation. They did not have a neurology inpatient service, but they had a very busy consult service there. Uh, and we co we covered that from Harborview. So whoever was on call at Harborview, if there was a, a call at night or at weekends at the public health hospital, you had to get in the car and drive to public health hospital and give them the consult. All right, so just thinking about what is required in training, and I think maybe not all of us even quite know this, but this um, went into play as near as I could figure out at the end of the 1990s, so about 1998. Um, and so the word was you needed to have at least six months of inpatient neurology. And believe it or not, there were some programs that only had one at the time, and so they had to beef up their inpatient neurology. Most patients were, or excuse me, most programs were, were really lacking outpatient neurology. So many programs didn't have any outpatient neurology at this time, and so you, the word was you also had to have six months of outpatient neurology. Continuity clinic could be counted toward that. Um, three months of elective. Psychiatry, this is a newer requirement. This came about um, when I was a resident. Three months of child neurology has been pretty standard, and then a weekly continuity clinic was a new development at the end of the 1990s. Um, the other, just to pay attention to other things that the ACGME does is it sort of promulgates um, a variety of standards um, that residents have to um, toe the line about. So we've seen these come down through the last uh, 
I don't know, 12 to 15 years, so the need to have these goals and objectives, the, thought, the, the, the whole um, competencies, the six competencies, that's something that comes from the ACGME, and then most recently, the, the milestones. All right, so I don't have very recent data on what people are doing sort of across the nation in terms of rotations. This is from 2007. Um, and then one thing to pay attention to is the instructions. This was a survey that was given to all program directors. Almost everybody responded to it, and they kind of let um, the Association of Program Directors for Neurology know what the rotations are like at their institution. Um, you were supposed to subtract out continuity clinic from inpatient months. I don't know that everybody did that. Um, but this is just kind of showing what the state was across the, across the country in 2007. And then what, what is it like at, at our site? And, and I have to say, so one of the things when I came into this position that I really wanted to, to see if we could um, have, I knew we need more outpatient neurology and I wanted to try to make that happen and, and really have not, that hasn't happened very much. And why is that? We have so many more residents now why aren't they spending more time doing outpatient neurology or, or elective? And really the answer is that we've, that, that, that over the years, more and more people, the, the, the inpatient teams have gotten bigger and bigger. And part of that is because to um, comply with uh, uh, the, the rules related to call. And part of it is just because it seems as though the services are busier um, or, there's, or the work takes longer. But um, we've added a consult service at Harborview. We've added a, 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 another resident to the UW service. Um, where there used to be just two residents in Tom's Day covering the whole uh, 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 service at Harborview. Now there are one, two, three, four, five, and, and that doesn't count the other people on the team. So um, really, Dr. Ramba um, has spent just about as much time on inpatient rotations as, as Dr. Bird did. And the, and the map here is also um, taking her continuity clinic and putting it over here into a clinic. So three months of required clinic, but also a continuity clinic, which doesn't always feel like you're doing outpatient because you're sort of leaving your inpatient job. So it's a lot of, you know, doing different things, whereas Dr. Bird, I think, wishes maybe he had more clinic when he was a resident, um, um, but was doing less sort of running between sites to do, to, to, to make that happen. Um, and then I mean, the way VA, less neuropath. The VA hospital had no clinic. Um, there was no outpatient <laughs> clinic. Yeah. Dr. Williams. So, but I think the other thing that's important to, to remember is back then, and even I was a resident, you admitted patients to the hospital for workups that we now do entirely as outpatients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so even though it looks like there's a preponderance of inpatient care, in fact, you're doing a lot of the same workups now that, that the residents are doing on, on an outpatient basis. And there's been a lot of shift in That's where, true. where people receive their care. And much longer stays. At, uh, right. Right. in the 70s for things that people would go to a skilled nursing facility. Uh, it sounds like a lot of those facilities really didn't exist or were very uncommon. Um, so people would end up staying in the hospital for a long time. One of the things Dr. Bird told me about the VA was, um, well, how did you follow up on someone who was in the hospital? There wasn't a clinic. There was a treatment room. That It sounds like something you'd like at a spa to me, but that's not what it was. It was like a clinic room. So the patient would come back in a month and you'd see you leave your inpatient service and you'd go see the patient in the treatment room and see how they were doing. Go ahead. I think there's a lot of light-footed accounting going on about this business of clinic exposure because way back to the time parallel to when Tom was a resident, we would go to the clinic that was part of whatever hospital we were in. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever counted it, but you would spend the part of the afternoon when clinic was being run, if you were at that hospital. So a segment, you know, maybe 15% or 20% of your time at a given hospital assignment was spent in their outpatient mm -hmm. clinic. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that you would spend a fair amount of time in, in most of the hospitals, you had a good lengthy exposure while you were at that hospital to its cadre of outpatients, and I, I think that that experience, although we all had it, is kind of glossed over by the kind of accounting where they say you must be in clinic all of the time for that rotation, which in fact for most places is clumsy. Mm -hmm. There isn't enough to do all day, all week in most outpatient clinics attached to modest size hospitals. Mm -hmm. And so the point being made is 
actually years ago people would often spend time in clinic when they're on an inpatient rotation sort of like what happens at the VA nowadays although I have to say some of the people who I polled really said they spent very little time in any clinic whatsoever so I think people's experiences differed oh it was not required he did do EMG sorry okay. and, and for example Megan has done more than just okay. one month of EEG and EMG but she elected to do it so dr. Krauss did an elective Time period that included a lot of EMG, so don't 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 be too worried. So okay. Pardon. Yes. Yeah, that would be what that was one of his electives. I mean, it was very interesting actually. Dr. Krauss had submitted a proposal of the electives he wanted to do. He designed it himself, um, and so he had some EMG, he had some uh, carotid duplex, uh, and he also mentioned the fact that he would also be doing clinic during that time, two to five um, half days of clinic during his elective time. Look at the difference in neural path. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yes. And Dr. Bird got, he was shorted on his neural path because I think they needed another person at the VA that month. But we, we You'd be to, even smarter. We used to travel to places like uh, St. Peter's Hospital in Olympia and Western State Hospital, the psychiatric institution down in Silicon. We would travel there to do brain cutting. Mm. Mm. Um, people were asking about call. This is probably too detailed. I think the big thing to remember is this call was split between a, a much smaller class back in the day. Um, but interestingly, the, they really did their call all on their inpatient blocks. There was no call when you're on neural paths, so those are, well, were much more relaxed months. Um, Q3, when you're on inpatient months, sometimes it went to Q2 home call, is what Dr. Krauss told me. He used to cover the VA and the UW from home, Q2. Um, and then backup call, you would be on, even sometimes as an N1, for example, at the VA, because you'd have a medicine um, resident, uh, you would be the backup for the whole month. Um, the call now uh, is still Q, is Q4 um, uh, at Harborview for the N1s, Q3 at the VA. Our seniors take a variety of calls depending on where they're on. They still have some pretty rigorous backup, um, uh, at, especially at Harborview. Okay, so let's just think, I wanted to just put together sort of, this is, uh, this is completely made up, hypothetical, thinking about what might Dr. Ramba do um, for a, a, a day and a night at Harborview, all right? So this is just me imagining her sitting at the hospital. She's going to follow up on some labs, right? She's going to go ahead and round on the, on the patients with her team. That will always include her attending. Um, she's going to, at, at 9.30, go to neuroradiology and look at the night's MRIs and CTs and, and discuss those. Um, she had an interesting patient with eye movement abnormalities. She's looked this up ahead of time, so she'll do a little bit of teaching on that. Um, there's a noon conference that day, and she'll attend that. She's got some pesky administrative things to do, so she'll look at her Epic inbox and follow up on some of her clinic issues. She needs to look at her email. Dr. Oaks is pestering her about something, and she responds. There's a mandatory survey. She goes ahead and responds to that. Um, MedHub is, is uh, binging her um, uh, inbox, so she goes ahead and completes a faculty evaluation. She's got a couple of family meetings uh, to attend to. She gets a call that someone's going to leave AMA, and she goes to, to chat with that, that um, patient. She fields a lot of questions during the day, and then she does admit two patients um, and writes both paper and that should say ORCA that notes. That's, her That's just her day. That's just her day. Um, all right, please. Let's and just to compare the day, how might Dr. Bird's day look different? So he also is going to follow up on labs in a very different way. He's going to look at them in a paper format. Someone has brought up the papers from the labs. He's going to go ahead and round on patients, and he may or may not round with an attending. So he basically had Monday, Wednesday, Friday rounds with attendings um, at some of the hospitals. There's no um, films to review with neuroradiology. There are some plain films that he'll probably look at, probably on his own. I'm not sure. Um, uh, he also is uh, very capable at teaching about eye movement ab abnormalities, and he will do that. These are all things that, that doesn't do. There, there, there was a neurology grand rounds, and that was really the only conference during the week, although he might sometimes go to medicine grand rounds. Doesn't have any um, epic inbox to check. Um, not much pestering with email. Uh, I don't know. I'm su I suspect he some had some other evals to fill out at some point. He will have the family meetings. He will visit that other patient, um, answer questions, and admit two patients. What does the night look like? So, of course, yes. So, radiology, we had films, and you had to go down to radiology. You had to make friends with the film librarian because if you didn't, you were hosed. And you would be in trouble if somebody else had gotten there first and taken the films to go show to another attending physician. 
Yeah. Physically them carried them away. Physically carried mm -hmm. them away, and, and you had to have a few box to, to, to do that. And none of that could we do remotely. Mm -hmm. So we, we had to be in hospital to do all of, all of that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Williams reminds us of how difficult it was to review films at that point in time when everything was a shaky, I don't know, whatever that sheet was made out of, um, being lost, being taken away, um, so a whole different uh, type of problems. Pardon? Did you have a pager, Dr. Bird? Not as a, a first year neurology resident. No, yes. no pager? So how were you reached? Overhead page. Overhead page. Overhead page, right. Okay, I forgot about that. Yes. And so how many times during the day were you interrupted by? Oh, a lot. <laughs> Overhead. Oh, yeah, people were being paged all the time. <laughs> Dr. Bird, you have a consult on floor three, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so just continuing with Megan's night, she ends up uh, admitting a respectable number of, of patients. She has to do a lot of documentation on each. Someone needs an EEG, so she pages the EEG. Uh, tech, she may review the spot EEG. Um, she goes ahead and does a couple discharge summaries. There's two code strokes, which would not be at all unusual for a night. Um, she has an interesting patient who she thinks has hypokalemic periodic paralysis, so she does a PubMed search so she can teach the team in the morning. Um, she helps her intern with a patient in rapid AFib. She does an LP. She returns some calls from inpatient family members, who's one of whom had her pager number for some reason. Um, she responds to some MedCon calls on clinic patients and puts notes into EPIC takes a look at the um, films, again responding to questions, she rounds with the team in the morning, she needs to be out by 11, and she needs to log her duty hours in MedHub, um, or she'll get another email from um, Dr. Oaks or Stella. And then what does Dr. Um, Bird's day look like? He also admits five patients. He writes paper notes, which are a bit briefer than Dr. Ramba's. Um, he does need to go, I said admitted at the public health hospital, but he needs to go do a consult at the public ho health hospital, so he drives there to do that. Um, sees a couple new consults. Um, someone needs an EEG, so he puts the leads on and reviews the EEG. Um, he doesn't have any stroke codes. Um, he doesn't have a PubMed search to do. He might want to do a literature search, but he'll probably do that at a, a later point in time. He does some of the other same things that Megan did. And then, this is interesting, so, so he, someone needs an angiogram. So he doesn't call radiology to get the angiogram done. He does it himself. Um, and this was fairly common. And um, Dr. Bird described this whole process to me, and it sounded um, alarming, but it sounds like not that many people actually had complications. So this had to do with, if I understand it right, palpating the carotid, um, putting a needle in, and the, the, the whole object was to go through the carotid, and I had to have him repeat that. That means through both sides. That means go through and then go through again. That's what would happen. Um, then you would pull the needle back. You would get your spurt of blood. You would hook it up to the tubing and then you would put your dye in. I probably missed a few steps, but, and then what would come of that is you would work with a radiology resident and another person, maybe a medical student, to have the patient lying down sort of like this and then shoot the pictures, one, two, three, to get the various phases of, of dye in the there. On what kind of, like a... No, a plain so, film, yeah? So there, there were plain film there, but there was a, my first year as an N1, there was a, a, a cassette under the patient's head, and it had three films in it. So there was one person shooting the dye into the carotid. There was the radiology resident who was pushing the button in the radiology uh, booth to take the picture. And then there was usually an intern or a student who held on to the cassette, and you would say, uh, uh, push, when you put the dye in. And the radiology resident would say, shoot, that means he pushed the button and took the picture. And then the uh, next person would say, pull. And so the student would pull out that film. So it was gone. And then they would say, shoot, he pushed the button again and take a second film. And he'd say, pull, he'd pull that one out. It's like play pigeons. And then he'd say, shoot, and you'd take the third one. And if you, you tried to time it right so that you got an arterial phase, a capillary phase, and a venous phase. One picture each. When I came back after the Vietnam War, this had been automated, so you didn't need the poll person. You didn't need the poll person. <laughs> <laughs> you have a stack of cassettes, and it was a mechanical. There was, was a mechanical. Cassette. Cassette. There was no biplane. There was no no mapping. 
Dr. Tully. What you would do with that information, I always think of at the end of your you know, how would you possibly have asked for a particular set of procedures that can work just to be able to Well, a lot of it was looking for brain tumors. Oh. It was a big deal was finding brain tumors. Because remember what you didn't have. Right. <laughs> or CT. Like, there, was, there, was, there was no CT scan, no MRI scan. Right. So oh, segue. So Dr. Bird, the night that I described, he did not have to do a pneumoencephalogram, but he might have to do that sometimes. And so that was another procedure that he was trained in, and that one sounds even wackier. And if I understand it, it has to do with injecting air in an LP, right? Okay. And then the air goes up to your ventricle. So this is designed to look at one's ventricles, all right? Um, uh, again, to diagnose maybe uh, nodular tumors. Um, tumors. Particularly third ventricle tumors. Okay. Oh, that would, or assist maybe. Impinging on the ventricles. Okay. Is that an example of one? Yes, this is one. I don't know what it's showing. I just that, got this off the very, internet. Not a very good one. Not a good one. Dr. Bird did not do this one. I just got it off the internet. Um, but, and the interesting part that you told me about was not only would you shoot this up and then wait and look at the air, but there was a, some of the air, the air did not easily go to, into the temporal um, ventricles. So you would somersault, literally somersault the patient, an agile patient, you would maybe help you with that. A, a larger, less agile patient would have trouble and would need a lot of people helping them to go upside down so the air would go to the, to the right places. Yeah, this, this was before the chair. But you told me that they purchased a chair and then the next year the CTs came into vogue or something like that yes, and it was really right. not used. Yep. And the other procedure that um, Dr. Bird would do would be a, a myelogram, which we're a bit more familiar with. Um, okay, just a couple other nuggets about inpatient neurology in the 1970s. So I thought, wow, with such few residents, you must have had services that were not very busy, but that was not true. So there was a 40-bed um, ward split about evenly between neurology and neurosurgery back in the day. Now, these were patients who would come to the hospital oftentimes and stay for a long time, um, people who would typically in our world go to a sniff. Um, but that was sort of the, the way things were. And people with a stroke, they would essentially, it sounds like maybe even be doing some, some rehab on our service. Um, Harborview, um, at this point, all overdoses came into neurology, largely because um, of Dr. Plum's interest in, even after he left, this sort of stayed on in, in coma. So even things like aspirin and antifreeze, and sometimes those were, were difficult for the neurology residents. And then in any hospital, this is just, I was asking Dr. Bird, you know, what were the most typical patients? And he said, obviously, strokes and seizures, a fair amount of brain tumor, but then even sort of chronic conditions would end up staying in the hospital for a very long time because there wasn't a lot of other options for them. Um, again, thinking about the therapies that are available. So you have someone with, with Guillain-Barre, but you don't have IVIG, you don't have plasma phoresis, so a lot of this was supportive care. And then a very interesting point is that the whole, even though there were ventilators for sure in the 1970s and before, um, ICUs are a relatively recent development. So Dr. Bird was telling me um, when he certainly was when he was an intern, and maybe even for your first year year or two of residency, there really weren't ICUs. So your patients would be in a floor room, perhaps on a uh, on a ventilator, um, but there wasn't that sort of level of ICU care that we think of for, for these patients. So the first yeah. ventilators were for a neurologic disease. Oh, were they for polio? Polio. Oh, for polio, of course. Uh huh. Uh huh. The neurologists were expected to manage the ventilators on the floor. So when I, when I came here as an intern, there was an iron lung in the basement of the University Hospital, but it wasn't being used because they had just introduced a thing called the bird respirator. And they were these small, portable, uh, plastic, green plastic machines that you could take by the bedside and do positive pressure, hook it up to a trach or hook it up to a, uh, a, a nasotracheal tube. And that's how you had the patient on a respirator. So it was, so you had, we, they had just moved away from iron lungs. I'm going to be over time, so I'm going to go through my latter slides fairly quickly. I did just want to make the point, I think the documentation requirements are hugely different now and then. There's been a number of studies of this, mostly of internal medicine residents, just sort of um, highlighting how much time residents spend, and, and I think this would be fair to say it, all doctors spend, um, documenting. Um, so uh, about half, this was a study, a, a small study, um, done at uh, Columbia shadowing residents, and it was found about half of residents' time is spent in front of, of computers. Now, it's not just doing documentation. You're checking labs, looking at films, etc. But about half of that time was documenting, so a quarter of one's time. And then this was a very big survey done of internal medicine residents back in 06, showing that um, 
uh, the vast majority of the residents spent at least four hours, if not uh, significantly more, um, on documentation. I do want to make this point. So supervision, what was it like back then? And so Dr. Bird used this oft-repeated phrase. It was really, they were resident-run run hospitals. And I thought, you know, we think that, that that's what I think, too. We, we certainly could never um, sort of manage our services where we very much depend on the residents, a crew like this, right, um, to, to um, manage patients. Um, and I think that's true, but it did have a different meaning, um, uh, I think, when Dr. Bird was a resident. And just to give you a sense, how many faculty members were there in neurology in 1970? One, two, three, four. There were four. Um, there was nobody at Harborview at that time in terms of a, a, a full-time faculty member. Dr. Sumi was there later. There were these um, downtown neurologists, is what Dr. Swanson called them, and it sounds like a number of people who had practices, and then they would come in round at the various hospitals uh, with the residents, and they would, they would see the patients, they would hear their stories. Um, they would usually do it three days a week, and so the other days it was really the residents making the rounds, although they would sometimes call their attendings with, with questions. Um, so that, it is a, that is a different sort of concept of resident-run uh, hospital. So there are very clear rules now about supervision. We need to have at least a one to, so, so that, that, that was not even a one-to-one -one ratio of faculty to residents, right? That was, even when there were only seven residents, it was four to seven, four to 12 sometimes. So we have, you, you have to have at least a one-to-one -one ratio. We have a three-to-one now. We have a lot more faculty. Um, there's a rule that we have to have rounds at least five days per week, and typically we have them every day of the week with the attending physician. And then there's just a lot more rules about sort of the types of situations that residents need to report. And it co there's actually several pages of rules um, in the ACGME, um, what they publish. Oh, I'll skip by this. This was just a hilarious thing I saw when I was looking. <laughs> this is from the 80s. Um, uh, okay. Um, I think I don't have to say too much about this. Just generally, residents today are very happy with their training. The types of things that they get concerned about are uh, this type of thing. We, we, don't, we don't have enough preparation in um, practice management, billing, et cetera. But their, their training, um, people feel quite good about, and they feel good about their teaching. Um, and so, so residents are surveyed every three years in a national. Uh, um, people who are graduating are surveyed. Um, here at the UW, people similarly say good things. So this is a yearly survey that the ACGME puts out. People say good things overall about sort of our compliance with a variety of things like duty hours, faculty supervision, et cetera. The one thing that we continue to do very poorly on is um, education being compromised by service. So this year we were only in 11% compliance. So mostly residents say good things about their training here with some exceptions. I wanted to know what Dr. Bird thought about, and so I asked him a little bit about this when we were chatting. Um, and he mentioned he thought it was a really good thing to have a lot of responsibility early on. But maybe it wasn't always the best thing for patient care. Um, he noted a really rich hospital experience, which I think we have today, but almost no clinic experience. Um, remembers his attendings extremely fondly um, and thought it was really good to get this perspective of those downtown neurologists as well, um, something that's sort of been lost. Um, but notes that residents today really benefit from the technology that we have and said sort of this old arrogance of the diagnosis is what the attending says it is. Um, is sometimes quite, is no longer there now that we have MRIs, not that you can use an MRI to diagnose everything. Um, I'll skip we over the, this is just a little bit interesting, the, so duty hour rules went into effect, what do residents, and so this is again is a national survey, think about duty hour rules, and this is sort of early, this is from 2007, so most residents th thought patient care is improved, education is improved, and certainly quality of life. Program directors agreed with the quality of life, but disagreed in terms of improvements in patient care or education. And I guess the residents weren't asked about faculty workload, but the program directors thought that it had increased. I did want to mention this because so now the pendulum is swinging a little bit the other way with duty hour rules. And there is a study that has been published amongst surgical residencies. Probably most, a lot of people have heard of this, the first trial. So this allows. Um, it allowed programs to have more flexible hours that still conform to the 80-hour work week, but allowed, for example, interns to be have more traditional call, um, be in house overnight, um, and allowed uh, other, uh, I think, sometimes shorter periods between shifts worked. Uh, and then, and this was done at over 100 uh, sites, um, and then um, the, and it was basically this non-inferiority study, and the outcome was that it it was non-inferior in terms of. Um, one big concern is that um, uh, patient care uh, would be compromised, um, and that was not seen when they were looking at um, deaths or serious uh, outcomes. Um, 
Uh, and then the trainees uh, who were in the flexible program, so sort of the old rules, thought there was better continuity of care, more professionalism. Um, but in the old, in the sort of today's programs, the ones with today's duty hours, um, the residents felt that they had a better quality of life, maybe not surprisingly, but nothing that was really statistically significant between those two. So um, no one quite knows what, how this will all come out in the end. Um, some people uh, think that it will, that programs will be allowed to be more flexible and maybe go back to the old system if they want to, but that hasn't been decided. And there is an ongoing study that our own institution has participated in with medicine residents, very similar. Um, uh, the, the, the early word on the street is that the results seem like they're similar, but that is sort of just our, um, for our site director talking about what, what the results he got from his um, trainees, and I think he's also talked to some of the other the directors. So that remains to be seen, whether there will be a little bit of a swing back. Um, I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to just mention that the vast, the, the question that comes up all the time in the, in the literature is, should we be, um, should neurology residency be longer? In Canada, neurology residency is five years, although a lot of that is, the, the extra year is medicine. Um, and, you know, our, most residents get five years or more of training because they end up doing a fellowship. Um, 88% <coughs> in 2014. There's a lot of fellowships. There's the full list from the AAN. Many of them are not necessarily ACGME um, accredited, but they're, they're just a lot of fellowships. Okay, so conclusions. Um, this really isn't a talk on how to train a neurologist, because I don't think that that is really known. It's more just descriptive. How do we train neurologists? Um, and it's really influenced by a lot of different factors. So I w it would be nice to think that this was all influenced by what are sort of the best practices, what's the ideal training. Um, that's not how it's evolved. Um, like with many things, I think there's a lot of different influences. Um, decisions of, of multiple national groups, hopefully, that take this into account, um, uh, but have moving targets, as we can see, about what they think is the best way to train residents. Um, certainly, funding plays a huge role, and I really haven't talked much about that at all. Not just funding for residents, but funding for patient care and reimbursement, and how do faculty get paid. Uh, and then patient care needs and institutional needs certainly play a role as well. Um, I think an important conclusion um, that I've made is that the, the cornerstone of our training remains evaluating and managing patients, and I think that's right. I think that's the way that it should be. Um, we can argue about little this amount of inpatient, outpatient, etc., um, but as messy as it is and as much as you can maybe miss things, that's, I think that's, that's, that should be the cornerstone. Um, there is a trend towards more outpatient experiences, but I think that those could still be expanded. Um, I certainly think residents work hard both then and now, um, maybe in different ways. Um, one significant difference, I would say, is more time spent on documentation. I'm not sure how good that is. Um, more trainee autonomy, for sure, um, uh, back uh, a couple decades ago. Um, maybe this was better for learning. Um, now there's certainly more supervision. Is that better for learning? Uh, I guess it depends on who the supervisor is. Um, is that better for, for patient care? And then finally, thank you. So I interviewed at length both Dr. Swanson and Dr. Bird for this, and I really, and, and, and Phil couldn't be here. He is in London. Um, but thank you very much um, for that. Um, and then thank you to our residents. I think I, most of you are in these collective pictures uh, for um, providing with uh, sort of the uh, inspiration to do this. Um, and then just the title of my talk was really um, inspired by my children, especially this one, because this is one of his favorite movies. It's on at our house a lot, How to Train a Dragon. Um. Yes, Chris. So in relation to the demand for neurologists in large portions of the country, there's C. Miller Fisher quote, um, how staff learn neurology literally stroke by stroke. He was certainly referring to neurology residents, but I always assume he was referring to interns and internal medicine residents as well. And it seems that, to me, that over the last 15 years, the consultant role of neurologists has shrunken and we're taking more inpatient responsibility. It may be insulating the exposure of internal medicine residents to neurology. Do you think that influences this? Because I mean, I think the internal medicine residents really, they never take care of neurology, or neurology cases as inpatients nowadays. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, and I suspect our institution isn't alone in that. I think that that's, 
I mean, we're, we're required as a neurology residency to have our own inpatient service, and that's required everywhere. And once you have it, then that's where they're going to go. And yeah, I think that is a disservice. I mean, here, are, it's not, they have no requirement. So internal medicine residencies, I mean, it's one of their competencies. They have to know neurology, but there's no requirement to do a rotation. So um, here, everybody, the, the internal medicine folks all do at least one month, you know, at Harborview when they're uh, an, N1, or, excuse me, an intern. But they don't do more than that. And then the one, people who go in, if they're, if they're a hospitalist, someone who goes, Swedish isn't the best example because there's, there's a lot of in-house neuro folks there too, but at many of these hospitals, there's, not, there's, there's a consulting neurologist that never comes in at night. So yeah, I think that is a, a bit of a, of a problem. Um, and certainly in people who are practicing in more remote areas. Go ahead, yeah. I think you did a wonderful job on this. I would like to add a historical note. In the early 60s, shortly after the Korean War, there was a dip in availability of neurologists that caused considerable concern. And in fact, NIH took up an answer to this and sponsored a large number of neurology residencies around the country, usually in well-established, large state universities. Mm -hmm. And I know this because when I did my residency in Michigan, they had gotten one of these grants, like several other universities, that had well-established neurology programs. So this has happened before. Mm -hmm the concern that we need mm -hmm. more neurologists, and that was one answer in a different era. Uh, the other thing I would add, what I guess is my own opinion, and that's this business of um, when you expose medical students to neurology. And you know, neurology, of course I'm speaking to neurologists, is a rather sophisticated form of medicine. And not every medical student instantly is a physician simply because they get through the second year. And in order to employ neurology skills, you have to have a background in physician skills. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the patients, getting a usable history, and so on and so forth. And if neurology is cranked into that too early, my observation has been that the students don't pick up on it as well as they do in their fourth year. They're ready to learn a new set of skills, and they've already developed some physician skills. The, um, I'm, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten your name, Dr. Troopin. Dr. Troopin is making the, a few different points, um, one being the importance of uh, students learning some medicine, some doctoring essentially, before they take on the complexity of neurology as a reason to delay that clerkship. Um, and I think that's a, I think that my bias is just that I want people to be interested in neurology and to come to our specialty and that will, will more realistically happen in the third year than the fourth. And I think one um, nice thing to think about with that, how, how you could sort of compromise is is the fact that medical students are getting real clinical training. More and more schools are moving to having more clinical training even in the second year. So you can bump it up. Now that we make people sign on the dotted line really quite early, um, people need experience that will guide that decision. Go ahead, Dr. Williams. Sure. You know, one of the things that I, I think about, you know, the, the differences between documentation, those of us who grew up with pens and, and paper and, and now using electronic medical record is nobody would have copied and pasted an entire mm -hmm. CT scan report mm -hmm. into their handwritten note. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so one of the, the concerns, I think, is that we're very good at copying and pasting and automatically incorporating things. But when you we were writing our notes, and I think our challenge is how do we help new residents and students learn how to do this, is you have to pick and choose, and you have to synthesize everything to, together. And you would always write your own interpretation of what the, the arteriogram showed or, or the CT scan and so forth because your own interpretation is what would then guide the, the diagnosis and, and the decisions that, that you would make. So I, 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 and it's certainly not unique to here, it, it's all over the country. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how do we uh, document things that are important in a way 
that actually becomes part of the learning process instead of copying and pasting. And I, I know that there's a big struggle across all electronic medical records and debates about whether copying and pasting reports, for example, should be allowed at all. I think in neurology, it's particularly important to show what you thought an MRI scan showed or a CT or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and learning how residents and students have interpreted the film on their own is how we can then help them through our own interpretation of going to the radiologist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. There's an uh, editorial in New York Times today from the resident at the NCH uh, really talking about how medical school teaches a lot of memorization. And today, really, there are so many things that, that doctors, residents need to know, but they don't really need to memorize because they're sitting in front of the computer all the time. And I think neurology is really, uh, it's, a, it's a critical thing to be thinking about because traditionally in medical school we taught neuroanatomy more so than neuroscience. And now, you know, are we really turning a lot of people away from neurology because they think it's about memorization, neuroanatomy, and they don't really get that, you know, early exposure to the doctoring side of neurology, how interesting it is to actually get the right history and put it together, and that it's, it's really not you know, about memorizing what part of the brain goes to what part of the brain goes on. And I don't know if anybody's talking about that in the book, but to me it seems like there's a real huge paradigm shift in what a neurologist actually needs to be. It seems like with the articles that I read, not so much for neurologists, that there still seems to be people thinking and I, I think many people would say you need to know both, that we can't forget about the neuroanatomy, um, that at least neurologists need to know about that. But certainly for other people dealing with folks with neurologic disease, that's a common theme is um, you don't, to, to, to do a good job evaluating a lot of neurologic problems, you don't need to have that detailed neuroanatomic knowledge. The, the analogy was there's a lot of people who do a good job driving a car and who have no idea how the engine works, which is maybe a little bit too much of a, of a exaggeration. But that's, I would see that kind of thought process applied more towards internists who need to become less scared about neurology, maybe need to refer less and take care of, be more comfortable with a lot of different neurologic problems. But no, I mean, I think that's a point that's that's well taken, is there's a lot more, and, and, and I'm not that familiar with the neuroscience course um, of today. I don't, I don't really know what it consists of. The, the one article that I showed you about the um, neurophobia, um, definitely uh, an, a recommendation that came out of that was to try to early on um, incorporate clinical scenarios with the neuroscience, um, that that makes it more approachable and more interesting and more applicable. Um, and I, I should, we should have um, my camera here, someone here who's, who's, who's designing the, the curriculum because I'm not sure if that's something that's going to be changed. Maybe because of the late time, we'll thank Dr. Oates again for oh, the chat with anybody.